Our friends from Cincinnati have joined us. Uh, to my left, Kevin Johnson. To his left, Troy Copain. And to Troy's left, Gary Clark. UCLA will meet Cincinnati tomorrow at approximately 6.40 p.m. Pacific time, 9.40 Eastern, and that'll be the second game of our doubleheader tomorrow. Oregon and Rhode Island uh, tip it up at 4.10 in the afternoon. Kevin, I'll start with you. Quick question. How much have uh, you guys had a chance to look at anything regarding UCLA? Um, I mean, all season I've watched uh, UCLA, but now we're starting to get into our scouting report. Um, we learned a lot about them uh, yesterday, um, watching that game. And uh, today we're going over some things, and tomorrow we'll be going over some things. Uh, we know it's a solid team with uh, a lot of weapons, and we're coming up with our defensive schemes to um, figure out ways how to, how to uh, control the game and make it a tough game for them. Troy, how about you? Uh, same thing uh, Kev said. Um, I caught a couple games, you know, being up late and watching on ESPN. Um, but I'm leaving it up to the coaches, you know, just follow the scouting report, follow the little things and what we need to do best to make it a great game. They got a lot of weapons and how to keep the game, you know, from getting out of hand. Okay, questions for the student athletes. Ben Bolch, Los Angeles Times. Have you guys played anybody that has a, kind of the, the up-tempo offense, the extent that UCLA has? And when, you, and when you're playing a team like that, how do you impose your kind of slower, grinded out style? I think you guys are averaging holding teams down four seconds or, or extending possessions four seconds longer than UCLA likes to play. How, how do you do that? Um, no live ball turnovers. Uh, no make the game, get up and down, and get back in transition. Hey, Gary, you guys are in this game, everybody's talking, a lot of people will be talking about UCLA and their potent offense. Uh, you're viewed as the underdog, I think, by most. How do you guys uh, look at that? Uh, a challenge, or, what, or how do you overcome that? Oh, we just look at it. It's another game. It's another game. And, you know, since I've been here, most of the games where the other team is pretty good, we've all been, always been labeled an underdog. So as a Bearcat, you know, it, you just go in prepared, you know, following the scout report as you've done all week and getting prepared to uh, get a W. So, you know, everyone has their own opinion about who's supposed to win throughout the tournament. but. It's all about who comes prepared to play that night. Troy, how well, a couple questions. How well do you know Lonzo Ball, if at all? Um, I don't really know him. I've seen him. I've watched his highlight tapes on YouTube, um, watched him play, hear all the videos about him. He's a great player. You follow his, his dad's exploits at all? No, I've seen him on Sports Center a couple of times, but I don't really watch TV. We, we all know what a big fan your mom is and the lengths that she goes to watch you play. What, what would your reaction be if your mom said that you were a better player than Steph Curry? What would be my reaction? If your mom came out and said that. Um, that's my mom being my mom, but I mean, I wouldn't think my mom would say that about Steph Curry. We all know what Steph Curry does. He's in the league, I'm still in college. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> the reason I asked, I mean, Lonzo's father said that Lonzo was better than Steph Curry. Yeah, um, I don't know what you want me to say about that. <laughs> All right. Tony? Troy, good response, man. Um, I do want to ask you about this. You guys are 13 and 0, shooting 50% or better. The other day, uh, overall, you shot 62. Yesterday, you shot 62% overall, 67% in the first half. How do you guys, you know, continue to play at that level? Confidence and then establishing your your big man early. Uh, it's best to always play inside out. Uh, if you get shots around the basket, you know consistently, you know those are a higher percent of shot than shooting a three point shot or a long two. So just trying to get the ball around the basket in the paint, establishing your presence early, and then once you make a couple inside, the basket gets bigger and bigger, and then your confidence grows and grows, and then the game takes over for itself.
Any other questions? Come on, guys. <laughs> ben? Looking at your offensive and defensive efficiency, you guys are one of the most balanced teams uh, statistically in the country. I was just curious, how much practice time do you devote to offense versus defense, and what do you kind of attribute to being good on both sides of the ball? That goes to the coach. Uh, coach, is a, he doesn't really care about offense for real. We do, we do offense for ourselves because we're tired of our other teammates at practice locking us up. You know, we're tired of the person that's guarding you, lock your very time and coach, you know, gassing him up, like, yeah, shut him down, shut him down. So then offense comes once you have somebody continuously heating you up every day, and that's at all five positions. Uh, for any of you three, uh, based on the tape that, that you've seen so far, I know you mentioned the live ball turnovers. What else do you think will be key for you guys tomorrow against UCLA? Um, you know, I can't tell you as a player. I'm just tell you I don't know what to tell you. I'm going wait for our meeting tonight between our coaches, and our coaches are going to give us the best remedy, you know, to come out victorious. Similar question, Troy. You talked about looking at the YouTube video of Lonzo. Obviously, he has a lot of publicity behind him. When you get to this point in the tournament, how difficult is it to prepare for someone that you've never seen before? And do you go back to a YouTube or you just strictly use what the coaching staff says? Um, more what the coaches would say, what the coaches think, how, how to guard. That's how we say the coaches do a great job. They, they've been studying film, you know, which coach has this scout for t plus days. You know, they've been in and out, not even going to sleep. So whatever they would tell is the best way and then you go back and remember what the games you watched or the games that you – the highlights that you've seen, like, okay, yeah, he does this, he does this, or this player does this and then this, and you try to put it, you know, into a game-like situation. But you don't never really know. It depends on how the game is being played. Thank you, fellas. First, be here at the passers.
prosperity, okay? Okay, Coach Cronin is with us. Coach, uh, first question, um, how much since last night have you had an opportunity to take a look at your opponent tomorrow? A uh, little bit. Uh, sleep's overrated this time of year. <laughs> sleep's overrated this time of year, and uh, this is what you uh, work so hard for. So to get to this point, college coaches, we're all used to we were all kind of the kind of guys that probably had to cram anyway back in our college days. We probably weren't the best, most prepared students. So cramming is something I think we probably practice. So obviously we've been watching a lot of, a lot of, for myself, watching a lot of UCLA in the last whatever, 24 hours, not even that. But, uh, and uh, of course I have my staff, they've been working on it all week. So um, they're obviously impressive impressive team tremendous talent um, extremely well coached I think uh, you know what happens sometimes when a team has the talent that they have the, the coaching aspect isn't maybe talked about quite as much um, but uh, you know the things that they do are uh, are very hard to deal with so you know Steve makes it he he makes it really really hard on you in the half court he knows what each guy is capable of so if you take away one thing you're giving them something else that they're good at uh, and I think you know defensively they're better than people think they just have to play a lot of defense because they score so much so they're they just they play more defense than the average team so and again the more they play defense, it means the more they're scoring. And there's some more possessions in the game, which gives them a better chance to win because uh, of their skill level and their talent level. So I think he's playing exactly the way I would play if I was the coach uh, of that team. Uh, and he's done a, you know, Steve's just done an unbelievable job coaching them. They have a tremendous team. Ben? Ben Balch, Los Angeles Times. I, looking at some statistics, I think your defensive possessions averaged 18 seconds. Uh, their offensive uh, possessions averaged 14 seconds. How do you go about imposing your style on a team that likes to play fast in a game like this? You just really con confused me with the 18 seconds and 14. Did, did, you, talk, you need more sleep. Did you really figure all that out? Where'd you get all that? Oh, Ken Palm. Oh, okay. I, I do subscribe to Ken Palm as well. Uh, I just would, I, I'd simplify that. They're a lot faster than us. <laughs> but I was, they're, you know, I think Kentucky found out they're faster than everybody. Um, so, I, you know, obviously uh, they, uh, they can convert to offense faster than other people. So what I would tell you is our offense is going to be imperative uh, in this game that, it, it is, that we're successful offensively, uh, in getting second shots, uh, in scoring the basketball, or getting fouled. Because if you do not, they give them more opportunities to run downhill on you as quick as they can. It's their conversion is, is excellent. It's because they have probably the best passer since Jason Kidd or Magic Johnson playing with the ball in his hands. They throw 40-foot outlet passes. Uh, so. I think it starts with your offense. You know, I thought the other – and we, this isn't new for us. We talk about it all the time. The, you know, I think the reason we are as good as we've been all year on defense and historically is, is – but when you score and you get fouled, you're allowed – you're forcing teams to play five-on-five five against you. Um, and I think it, 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 it's the key to all defense in basketball. If you're constantly playing transition defense, you're not, not going to be very good. 
And if you're playing transition defense against this UCLA team, you're going to lose. You're not going to win. So that's why offense is so important. You sit there and say, well, our defense. Well, our defense is just as bad as everybody else's if we're on the run. I mean, we're on the run defensively, and our scouting report's out the window. They're going to they're gonna kill us. They're, you, know, it's just, you know, I thought Kent State did a great job, uh, and they probably offensive rebounded a little too much, and they exposed themselves on the back end. Uh, but that's kind of what Kent State does. I mean, they're a great, you know, top ten offensive rebounding team. They probably just didn't want to get away from it. Um, so our ex hopefully we can execute and score to where we don't have to sell out and send everybody to the glass. Because if you do, they're, they're just going to – eventually they're going to get going on you. I don't know how many seconds it will take, though. I don't know who it was. I want to give the proper credit. But somebody – called you Kent State on steroids. Is, is that a, a fair uh, label to put on you guys? Uh, well, I think Rob Senderhoff's a little bit bigger than me, so I don't think that's fair. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Um, and I, to be honest with you, I don't know much about Kent State. You know, i, I got to be real honest with you. And that's about – I've watched so many UCLA films. That's, i watched one of those, and I, then since then I've watched three Arizonas, two USC's two Oregons, and a Washington State. So I don't even remember right now uh, much about Kent State's team. Tony. Coach, um, T.J. Lee, five. He should have came to Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> okay. His quickness is kind of deceiving. He gets to the basket. Uh, just uh, all-around skillful freshman. What is your thoughts since you didn't get him anyway, yeah. including process? Well, I remember uh, one time I was with Coach Huggins. We were at the NBA Draft Combine uh, with DeMar Johnson and Kenyon Martin. And uh, there was a few drinks, I got to be honest, uh, that night. Uh, but Kevin McHale was talking basketball, and he was talking about – people were asking what they thought made him so effective. And he said he thought it was his ability to make a shot. Because when you, when you have that type of skill and that type of height and people can – you can shoot the ball and people have to come at you. And when people have to come at you, it brings everything else into play. Uh, so he's, he's so skilled and he can make a shot that you have to come up and guard him, which now brings his up and under or his step through or his ability to go by you, what have you. Uh, so he can score in different ways, but it all starts with the fact you have to guard him. Uh, and, and he gets people coming at him. Now, also, the rest of them are so good that sometimes you help off of him, now you have to go at him in recovery. When you have to go at a guy that's as good as that, uh, they usually are going to pick you apart. They're gonna, if you don't go at them, they're going to shoot it in. If you do, they got enough talent to put a hurt on you, one way or the other, score or get fouled. So somehow, uh, against all their guys, you want to stay out of that rotation where you're coming towards them to guard them. You need to be there to have a chance and be set. He can still break you down. He's good enough. He can still score on you. Uh, but again, you know, it's about getting our defense set and set on, on Leaf because he's got just so many ways he can hurt you. And then his offense, he's throwing his offensive rebounding, which he's excellent at. Doc, got to get my briefcase. I got something for you. And I can hear you, Matt. Can you hear? All right. Uh, Bryce Alford hasn't he hasn't shot the ball all that well lately, but obviously he's dangerous when he does get it going. Um, you know, how yeah. much does that play into the way that you guys will approach the game? First of all, I'm I'm nervous about that because I'm a big believer in, in the law of averages. Uh, so, you know, if a guy's a great shooter and he's been struggling, it's going to go the other way. It's just saying, you know, nobody makes every shot. So, we'll play him just like everybody else plays him. You know, you, uh, obviously, if you, you, you let him get his feet set, he can carve you up and change a game, you know, because the three is such a, su such a game changer. A guy like that hits five, six, or seven on you. It's going to be hard to win the game if you give him that kind of night. Uh, so you just got to do everything you can. Again, you, if, if you're playing defense on the run, it's hard to find him. 
if you're trying, if you're sprinting back to the paint to stop a team in transition, it's going to be hard to find him at the three-point line. So, against great shooters, you just got to try to do everything you can to make their life hard. Uh, because if they, if you make it easy on them, and then the bucket tends to get bigger for those type of guys, and now they start making really hard ones. So I'm just a big believer in that. You got to do everything you can not to let them get started. Uh, so that maybe it puts a little press in their mind instead of let them get going, and now all of a sudden the basket gets bigger and it goes the other way. So, but you just got to do your best because he's he's capable. I've, you know, everybody that covers them has seen what I've been watching on film. You've been watching for four years. The kid's just had an unbelievable career. My respect level for him and what you have to go through for playing for your father at the highest level is uh, something I, I you know I can only imagine. So. Um, I root for him, and I've always rooted for him uh, because I know what he's dealt with, um, but not tomorrow. Um, after watching the tape that you've seen so far in UCLA, are they easily the best off offensive team you have seen all year? Um, I would say they're the most explosive. You know, I know at, at, uh, SMU had a rough day yesterday, and they, they blew a late lead, which, you know, it happened to Villanova. That's why this tournament is called March Madness. Um, but SMU's efficiency is very similar. Highly efficient team. Uh, obviously, LSU does it in a different or UCLA does it in a much different way. Uh, you know, they're much faster, much more explosive. Uh, probably more and more obviously more NBA players. I mean, they they, they got a guy that's going to be an NBA All Star uh, on their team. So. Talent, they're the most talented team without, without question and definitely the most explosive. And I, I, I would think anybody that plays them would say the same thing. Paul? Mick, the, the three has become so much more prevalent. I don't know if you saw um, the Oklahoma State-Michigan game. Um, I heard the Michigan made a bunch of them. Right? Uh, completely influenced by the three. But how have you had to change, adapt, whatever your coaching styles, philosophies, to the notion that if you really can't defend the three and shoot the three these days, you're going to have a difficult time winning a lot of games? Well, and I would add to that the shorter shot clock. Um, I think it, it is uh, the, another way the game is going. I think with the, here's where the threes, it, with the shorter clock, you don't have as much time. So if you have one shooter, you got more time to get him open. Now you see teams with the soft, soft press to burn a little clock. And then you can find that one guy that can shoot in your scouting report. Because college basketball is so much different than the pros. The coaches can control so much with the press, with the zones, the changing defenses, that if you don't have multiple shooters, you're easily defended with a shorter shot clock. That's where the, the – the, I, I think you know the, what's going out of the game uh, is some of it. Well, you've seen some guys maybe at play at Cincinnati in the last 25 years. A real athletic guy that plays really hard, but he can't shoot at all. You know, I, I think that guy's getting phased out because there's nowhere to hide him on the offensive end, and there's and there's not enough time in the shot clock to get the other guy open. They have enough time to if you soft press and you find one guy. And you can make t somebody's life really, really hard. I think so. The shorter clock, I think, exacerbates the fact that you need shooting. And obviously, defending it is that puts a premium on. The, I think where you see the game going smaller because you got to like for us, Gary Clark. We've worked really hard with him to be able to guard perimeter players because so many people play four guards nowadays that he's got to be able to go out there and defend at the three-point line and on the perimeter. And it's obviously he understands, too, it's good for his, his pro aspirations to be able to do that. Wherever his pro career may be, he's going to have to be able to defend the three-point line. So for players, it's imperative, no matter how tall they are, to be able to go guard the three-point line. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Mick, thank you. Doc, you, go, you guys been to the locker room? Have you guys been down there with the guys?